Hi everybody, David from Pineacker01, and today we're going to continue the reading of The Smoky God. The full playlist, uh, I'll put a link here, and I'll put a link down below in the description. Um, there's a full word from the author, and we read part two, which is the beginning of Olaf Jan's story, and today we're going to go into part three, Beyond the North Wind. Part three, Beyond the North Wind. I tried to forget my thirst by busying myself with bringing up some food and an empty vessel from the hold. Reaching over the side rail, I filled the vessel with water for the purpose of laving my hands and face. To my astonishment, when the water came in contact with my lips, I could taste no salt. I was startled by the discovery. Father, I fairly gasped. The water, the water, it's fresh. What, Olaf? exclaimed my father, glancing hastily around. Surely you are mistaken. There is no land. You're going mad. But taste it, I cried. And thus we made the discovery that the water was indeed fresh. Absolutely so, without the least briny taste or even the suspicion of a salty flavor. Now, I should add, uh, I did a quick search because I was almost sure of that, but of course it's true. As fresh water is less dense than salt water, it floats above the seawater. We filled our, our two remaining water casks and my father declared it was a heavenly dispossession of mercy from their gods of Odin and Thor. We were almost besides ourselves with joy, but hunger bade us in our enforced fast. Now that we had found fresh water in the open sea, what might we not expect in this strange latitude where ship had never before sailed and the splash of an oar had never been heard? Note 11 in volume one, page 196, Manson writes, it is a peculiar phenomenon, this dead water. We had at present a better opportunity of studying it than we desired. It occurs where a surface layer of fresh water rests upon the salt water, oh, well, there you go, of the sea. And this fresh water is carried along with the ship gliding on the heavier sea beneath it as if on a fixed foundation. The difference between the two strata was in this case so great that while we had no drinking water on the surface, the water we got from the bottom cock of the engine room was far too salty to be used for the boiler. We had scarcely appeased our hunger, continuing in the story now, when a breeze began filling the idle sails and glancing at the compass, we found the northern point pressing hard against the glass. In response to my surprise, my father said, I've heard of this before. It's what they call the dipping of the needle. We loosened the compass and turned it at right angles with the surface of the sea before its point would free itself from the glass and point accordingly to an unmolested attraction. It shifted uneasily and seemed as unsteady as a drunken man, but finally pointed a course. Before this, we thought the wind was carrying us north by northwest, but with the needle free, we discovered, if it could be relied upon, that we were sailing slightly north by northeast. Our course, however, was ever tending northward. In volume two, pages 18 and 19, Nansen writes about the inclination of the needle. Speaking of Johnson, his aide, one day, it was November 24, he came in to supper a little after six o'clock. Quite alarmed, he said, there's just been a singular inclination of the needle in 24 degrees, and remarkably enough, it's northern extremity pointed to the east. We again find in Perry's first voyage, page 67, the following. It had been observed that from the moment they had entered Lancaster Sound, the motion of the compass needle was very sluggish, and both this and its deviation increased as they progressed to the westward and continued to do so in a descending, so in descending this inlet. Having reached latitude 73 degrees, they witnessed for the first time the curious phenomenon of the directive power of the needle becoming so weak as to completely overcome by the attraction of the ship so that the needle might now be said to point to the north pole of the ship. Wow. The sea was serenely smooth, with hardly a choppy wave, and the wind brisk and exhilarating. The sun's rays, while striking us aslant, flourished tranquil warmth, and thus time wore on day after day, and we found from the record in our logbook we had been sailing 11 days since the storm in the open sea. Wow. By strict test economy, our food was holding out fairly well, but beginning to run low. In the meantime, one of our casks of water had been exhausted. And my father said, we will fill it again. But to our dismay, we found the water was now as salt as the region of the Laughlin Islands off the coast of Norway. 
this necessitated, this necessitated our being extremely careful of the remaining task. I found myself wanting to sleep much of the time, whether it was the effect of the exciting experience of sailing to unknown waters or the relaxation from the awful excitement incident to our adventure in a storm at sea, or due to want of food, I cannot say. I frequently lay down on the bunker of our little sloop and looked far up into the blue dome of the sky, and notwithstanding the sun was shining far away in the east, I always saw a single star overhead. For several days, when I looked for this star, it was always there directly above us. And that star was probably uh, Polaris, the so-called North Star, as you read the North Star or Pole Star, aka Polaris, is famous for holding nearly still in our sky while the entire northern sky moves around it. That's because it's located nearly at the North Sexual Pole, the point where the entire north sky turns. Polaris marks the way due north. And Polaris is part of... Uh, so here's the Big Dipper, and Polaris is the end of the handle of the Little Dipper. And you can use the Big Dipper to point, because the Big Dipper is really easy to find in the sky, and it points, the end of the pan points to the Polaris star, which is the Little Dipper. It was now, according to our reckoning, about the 1st of August. The sun was high in the heavens and so bright that I could no longer see the one lone star that attracted my attention a few days earlier. One day about this time, my father startled me by calling to my attention a novel sight far in front of us, almost at the horizon. Wow, it is a mock sun, explained my father. I have read of them. It's called reflection or mirage. It will soon pass away. That's going to be an interesting one. Might be what we call sun dogs. I've seen those sun dogs. Those are pretty cool. I've, uh, made videos of those. Yeah, same thing as a sun dog, a mock sun. But this dull red false sun, as we supposed it to be, did not pass away for several hours. For several hours, and while we were unconscious of its emitting any rays of light, still there was no time thereafter when we could not sweep the horizon in front and locate the illumination of the so-called false sun during a period of at least twelve hours out of every twenty-four. Yeah, those sun dogs are formed by crystals in the air, so obviously a lot of crystals up there in the north. Clouds and mist would at times almost, but never entirely, hide its location. Gradually, it seemed to climb higher in the horizon of the uncertain purpley sky as we advanced. It could hardly be said to resemble the sun, except in its circular shape, and when not obscured by clouds or the ocean mists, it had a hazy red brown bronzed appearance, which would change to white light like a luminous cloud, as if reflecting some greater light beyond. We finally agreed in our discussion of this smoky furnace colored sun that whatever the cause of the phenomenon, it was not a reflection of our sun, but a planet of some sort, a reality. Wow. Note 13, that's a long note. I'm gonna have to be to explain that one. Nansen on page 394 says, Today, another noteworthy thing happened, which was about midday we saw the sun, or to be more correct, an image of the sun. It was only a mirage. A peculiar impression was produced by the sight of the glowing fire lit just above the outermost edge of the ice. According to the enthusiastic descriptions given by many Arctic travelers of the first appearance of this god of life after the long winter night, the impression ought to be of Jubilant excitement, but it was not so in many cases. We had not expected to see it for days yet, so the feeling was rather one of pain. Disappointment it must have drifted farther south than we thought. So it was with pleasure that we soon discovered that it could not be the sun itself. The mirage was at first flattened out, glowing red, streak of fire on the horizon. Later, there were two streaks, the one above the other, a dark space between. And from the main top, I could see four or even five such horizon lines directly over one another, all of the equal length, as if 
could only imagine a square, dull red sun with horizontal dark streaks across it. It could hardly be said to resemble the sun, except in its circular shape. And there is the one, the, the sun dogs, the sun, the mock sun, as they called it, picture from the uh, sacredtext.com of the same book. Well, wow, interesting. Back to the story. One day soon after this, I felt exceedingly drowsy and fell into a sound sleep. But it seemed that I was almost immediately aroused by my father's vigorous shaking me on the shoulder and saying, Olaf, awaken, there's land in sight. I sprang to my feet and, oh, joy unspeakable, there, far in the distance, yet directly in our path were lands jutting boldly into the sea. The shoreline stretched far away to the right of us, and far as the eye could see, all along the sandy beach, waves breaking into the chalky foam. Receding, then going forward again, ever chain, ever chanting in monotonous thunder stone, tones, the song of the deep. The banks were covered with trees and vegetation. I cannot express my feeling of exultion at this discovery. My father stood motionless with his hand on the tiller, looking straight ahead, pouring out his heart in thankful prayer and thanksgiving to their gods, Odin and Thor. In the meantime, a net, which we found in, this, in the stowage, had been cast, and we caught a few fish, and materially added for our dwindling stock of provisions. The compass, which we had fastened back to its place, in fear of another storm, was still pointing due north and moving on its pivot, just as it had in Stockholm. The dipping of the needle had ceased. What could this mean? Then, to our many days of sailing, had certainly carried us far past the North Pole, and yet the needle continued to point north. We were surely perplexed, for surely our direction was now south. Perry's first voyage, pages 69 and 70, says, On reaching Sir Beam's Martin's Island, the nearest to Melville Island, the latitude of the place of observation was 75 degrees 09-23, and the longitude 103 degrees 44-37, the dip of the magnet Magnetic needle 88 degrees dash 25 dash 56 west in the longitude of 91 degrees dash 48, where the last observations on the shore have been made to 165 degrees dash 50 dash 09 east at their present station. So that we had, says Perry, in sailing over the space included between these two meridians, crossed immediately northward of the magnetic pole and undoubtedly passed over one of those spots upon the globe where the needle would have been found to vary 180 degrees, or in other words, where the North Pole would have pointed to the south. We sailed three days along the shoreline, three days, then came to the mouth of a fjord or river of immense size that seemed more like a great bay, and into this we turned our fishing craft, the direction being slightly northeast of south. By the assistance of a fretful wind, it came to our aid about 12 hours out of every 24. We continued to make our way inland into what afterward proved to be a mighty river in which we learned was called by the inhabitants Pitical. We continued our journey for 10 days thereafter and found we had fortunately attained a distance inland where ocean tides no longer affected the water, which had become fresh. The discovery came none too soon for our remaining cask of water was well nigh exhausted. We lost no time in replenishing our casks and continued to sail further up the river when the wind was favorable. Along the banks, great forest miles in extent could be seen stretching away on the shoreline. The trees were of enormous size. We landed after anchoring near a sandy beach and waded ashore and were rewarded by finding a quantity of nuts that were palatable and satisfying to hunger and a welcome change from the monotony of our stock of provisions. It was about the 1st of September, over five months we calculated since our leave taking from Stockholm. Suddenly we were frightened almost out of our wits by the hearing in the far distance, the singing of people, could imagine. Very soon thereafter, we discovered a huge ship gliding down the river directly toward us. Those aboard were singing in one mighty chorus that echoing from bank to bank, sounded like a thousand voices filling the whole universe with quivering melody. 
the accompaniment was played on string instruments, not unlike our harps. It was a larger ship than any we had ever seen. It was differently constructed. Note 15, Asiatic Mythology, page 240, Paradise Found, from translation by Sayus in a book called Records of the Past, we were told of a dwelling which their gods created for the first human beings, a dwelling in which they became great and increased in numbers, and the location of which is described in words exactly corresponding to those of Iranian, Indian, Chinese, Ediac, and Aztecian literature, namely in the center of the earth. Wow. Interesting. And the Mayans, I know, have a lot of, you know, stuff about under and, um, you know, nine, nine levels under the earth. A whole other, uh, whole other study actually on that. In any event, um, let's see what we can find on this one. Here we can find uh, these fragments of the old hammer on top of the Tiger Euphrates base located the center of the earth not in their own mist, but in a far off land of sacred associations where, quote, the holy house of the gods, end quote, wrote, uh, lowercase g, is situated, a land into the heart whereof man hath not penetrated, a place underneath the overshadowing world tree and besides the, quote, unquote, full waters. No description could more perfectly identify the spots with the Arctic pole of ancient Asiatic mythology Yet this testimony stands not alone, for in this fragment of another ancient text translated by Sais in Records of the Past, we are told of the dwelling which the gods created for, lowercase g, the first human beings, a dwelling in which they became great and increased in numbers in the location we described yet as we just read. In the Hindu appearance, we were, oh, this is very interesting. This is a whole other one I might, might have to read. I mean, this is incredibly interesting, the sacred texts and this is the, the link up here. And what we, we see is that they're using the lowercase g, which ties into the Bible. And the uh, um, some of you follow Jonathan Kleck on YouTube. He gets into this, not directly this, but into the, you know, Elohim's, Elohim as gods with a small g and what this could mean from the time of creation and how this uh, might tie into the Bible directly. It's, it's extremely interesting theories. Nonetheless, um, this is chapter four of the navel of the earth. Just to make that clear, and we might come back and visit this later. At this particular time, our sloop was becalmed and not far from the shore. The bank of the river covered with mammoth trees rose up several hundred feet in beautiful fashion. We seemed to be on the edge of some primeval forest that doubtless stretched far inland. The immense craft paused and almost immediately a boat was lowered and six men of gigantic statue rode to our little fishing sloop. They spoke to us in a strange language. We knew from their manner, however, they were not unfriendly. They talked a great deal among themselves and one of them laughed inwardly and as though in finding us a queer discovery had been made, one of them spied our compass and it seemed to interest them more than any part of our sloop. And here we can see um, in the sacred texts. They spoke to us in a strange language, and you see the picture here of the, of the giant beings was 12 feet tall. Now, take note of their clothing because of this and their, their uh, attire. Because if this is directly from the drawings of uh, Olaf Janssen, that could be rather interesting, of course, if a true story. Finally, the leader motioned us as if to ask whether we were willing to leave our craft and go aboard their ship. <laughs> what do you say, my son? Asked my father. They, they, they can't do any more than kill us. They seem to be kindly dispossessed, I replied. Although what terrible giants. They must be a select six of the kingdom's craft regiment. Just look at their giant size. We may as well go willingly as be taken by force, said my father, smiling, for they are certainly able to capture us. Thereupon he made known by signs that we are ready to accompany them. 
Within a few minutes, we were on board the ship, and half an hour later, our little fishing craft had been lifted boldly out of the water by a strange sort of hook and tackle and set on board as a curiosity. There were several hundred people on board this, to us, mammoth ship, which we discovered was called the Naz, meaning, as we afterward learned, pleasure, or to give a more proper interpretation, pleasure excursion ship, like their cruise boat. <laughs> if my father and I were curiously observed by the ship's occupants, this strange race of giants offered us an equal amount of wonderment. There was not a single man aboard who would not have measured fully 12 feet in height. They all wore beards, not particularly long, but seemingly short cropped. They had mild and beautiful faces, exceedingly fair with ruddy comp complexions. Their hair or beard of some were black and others sandy, but others yellow. The captain, as we designated the, dig the dignity in command of the great vessel, was fully head taller than any of his companions. The woman averaged from 10 to 11 feet in height. Their features were especially regular and refined, while their complexion was delicate tint heightened by a healthful glow. And your note, notation, according to all procurable data, the spot at the era of man's appearance upon the stage was in the now lost Myconian continent, which then surround the Arctic pole. That in that true original Eden, some of the early generations of men obtained to a statue and longevity unequaled by any countries known to a post diluvian history is by no means scientifically incredible. W M dot F dot Warren wrote Paradise Found, page 284. Interesting. This of course ties into the, uh, the legends of Atlantis and, uh, you know, for the great catastrophe about 8,000 years ago, as some will claim, and this map might. Uh, both men and women seem to possess that particular ease of manner, which we deem a sign of good breeding and notwithstanding their huge statues, there was nothing about them suggesting awkwardness. As I, a lad in only my 19th year, I was doubtless looked upon as a true Tom Thumb. And I had to look that one up because I wasn't sure, but it's a, a, the legendary English dwarf, Tom Thumb. Anyway, my father, six foot three, did not lift up the top of his head above the waistline of these people. Each one seemed to vie with others in extending courtesies and showing kindness to us, but all laughed heartily. I remember when they had to improvise chairs for my father and myself to sit at a table. They were ritually attired in a costume peculiar to themselves and very attractive. The men were clothed in handsomely embroidered, embroidered tunics of silk and satin and belted at the waist. They wore knee breeches and stockings of a fine texture, while their feet were encased in sandals adorned with gold buckles. We early discovered that gold was one of the most common metals known and that it was used extensively in decoration. Strange as it may seem, neither my father nor myself felt the least bit of solitude for our safety. We have become into our own, my father said to me. This is the fulfillment of the tradition told to be by my father and my father's father and still back for many generations of our race. This is assuredly the land beyond the north wind. We seem to make such an impression on the party that we were given especially into the charge of one of them, uh, the charge of one of the men, Jules Galilea and his wife for the purpose of being educated in their language. And we, on our part, were just as eager to learn as they were to instruct. At the captain's command, the vessel was swung cleverly about and began retracing its course up the river. The machinery, while noiseless, was very powerful. The banks and trees on the other side seemed to rush by. The ship's speed at times surpassed that of any railroad, railroad train on which I've ever ridden, even here in America. It was wonderful. In the meantime, we had lost sight of the sun's rays, but we found a radiance within, emanating from the dull red sun which had already attracted our attention. Now, giving out a white light seemingly from a cloud bank far away in front of us, it dispensed a greater light, I should say, 
than two than two full moons on the clearest night. Interesting. So this wasn't like a sun. This is more than just a sun dog they're seeing. You know? In twelve hours since the cloud of whiteness would pass out of sight as if eclipsed, the twelve hours following corresponded with our night. We were learned that these strange people were worshippers of this great cloud of night. It was the smoky god of the inner world. The ship was equipped with a mode of illumination, which I now presume was electricity, but neither my father nor myself were sufficiently skilled in mechanics to understand whence came the power to operate the ship or to maintain the soft, beautiful lights that answered the same purpose of our present methods of lighting the streets of our cities, our houses and places of business. It must be remembered the time of which I write was the autumn of 1829. And we were outside the surface of the earth, knew nothing then, so to speak of, of electricity. This is before the modern electricity was, was commonly known. A lot of stuff going on in Australia down south. Wow, the first US typographer Patents, America's first typographer, typewriter. Interesting. The electrically surcharged condition of the air was a constant vitalizer. I never felt better in my life than during the two years my father and I sojourned inside of the earth. Wow, they've done that two years? I mean, that's a long time. To resume my narrative events, the ship on which we were sailing came to a stop two days after we had been taken on board. My father said as nearly as he could judge, we were directly under Stockholm or London. The city we had reached was called Jewa, Jehua, Jehu. Significantly a seaport town, the houses were large and beautifully constructed and quite uniform in appearance, yet without sameness. The principal occupation of the peoples appeared to be agricultural. The hillsides were covered with vineyards, but the valleys were devoted to the growing of grain. I never saw such a display of gold. It was everywhere. The door casings were inlaid and the tables were venered, machines of gold, domes of public buildings were of gold. It was used most generously in the finishings of the great temples of music. Vegetation grew in lavish exuberance. The fruit of all kinds possessed the most delicate flavor. Clusters of grapes, four and five feet in length, each grape as large as an orange and apples larger than a man's head, typified the wonderful growth of all things on the inside of the earth. Wow. The great redwood trees of California would be considered mere underbrush compared with the giant forest trees extending for miles and miles in all directions. In many directions along the foothills of the mountains were vast herds of cattle were seen during the last day of our travel on the river. We heard much of the city called Eden, but were kept at Jewo for an entire year. By the end of the time, we had learned to speak fairly well the language of the strange race of people. Our instructors, Jules Galeria and his wife, exhibited a patience that was truly commendable. One day, an envoy from the ruler at Eden came to see us. And for two whole days, my father and myself were put through a series of surprising questions. They wished to know from whence we came, what sort of people dwelt without what God we worshipped, our religious beliefs, the mode of living in our strange land, and a thousand other things. The compass which we had brought with us attracted a special attention. My father and I commented between ourselves on the fact that the compass still pointed north, although we knew that we had sailed over the curve or edge of the Earth's aperture and were far along southward on the inside surface of the Earth's crust which according to my father's estimate and my own is about 300 miles in thickness from the inside to the outside surface. Relatively speaking, it is no thicker than an eggshell so that there is almost as much surface on the inside as on the outside of the earth. Well, interesting, uh, 300 miles. I'll come back to that when I wrap this series up at the end of the book. The great luminous cloud or ball dull red fire, fiery red in the mornings and evenings, and during the day giving off a beautiful white light, the smoky god. It is seemingly suspended in the center of the great vacuum, should be a small g, by the way, in a great vacuum within the earth and held to its place by the 
immutable law of gravitation or a re repellent atmospheric force as the case may be, I refer to the known power that draws or repels with equal force in all directions. The base of this electrical cloud or central luminary, the seat of the gods, is dark and non-transparent, save for innumerable small openings, seemingly in the bottom of the great support or altar of the deity upon which the smoky god resists or rests. And the lights shining through these many openings twinkle at night in all their splendor and seem to be stars, as natural as the stars we saw shining when in our home in Stockholm. Interesting. Expecting that they appear larger. The smoky god, therefore, with each daily revelation of the earth, appears to come up in the east and go down in the west, the same as does our sun on the external surface. In reality, the people with in believe that the smoky god is the throne of their Jehovah and is stationary. The effect of day and night is therefore produced by Earth's daily rotation. Wow, they believe. Interesting. I have since discovered that the language of the people of the inner world is much like Sanskrit. Yeah, Indian. That's how they belong to the Indo. Iric branch of the Indo-European South. After we had given an account of ourselves to the emissaries from the central seat of government of the inner continent, my father had in his crude way drawn maps at their request of the outside surface of the earth, showing the divisions of land and water and giving name of each of the continents, large islands and the oceans we were taken over land to the city of Eden in a conveyance different from anything we have in Europe or America. This vehicle was doubtless some electrical contrivance. It was noiseless and ran on a single iron rail in a perfect balance. The trip was made at a very high rate of speed. We were carried up hills and down dales, across valleys, and again along the sides of steep mountains without any apparent attempt having been made to the level of the earth as we do for railroad tracks. The car seats were huge yet comfortable affairs and very high above the floor of the car. On the top of each car were high geared flywheels, were high geared flywheels laying on their sides, which were so automatically adjusted that as the speed of the car increased, the high speed of these flywheels geometrically increased. Jules Galeta explained to us that these revolving fan like wheels on top of the cars destroyed atmospheric pressure or what is generally understood by the term gravitation. And with this force thus destroyed or rendered nugatory the car, as is safe from falling into one side or the other from the single rail, as if it were in a vacuum. The flywheels and their rapid revelations, the flywheels and their rapid revolutions, destroying effectively the so-called power of gravitation or the force of atmospheric pressure or whatever potent influence it may B, that causes all unsupported things to fall downward to the Earth's surface or to the nearest point of resistance. The surprise of my father and myself was indescribable when, amid the regal magnificence of the spacious hall, we were finally brought before the great high priest, ruler over all the land. He was richly robed and much taller than those about him, he could not have been less than 14 feet or 15 feet in height. The immense room in which we were received seemed finished in solid slabs of gold, thickly stubbed with jewels of amazing brilliance. The city of Eden is located in what seems to be a beautiful valley, yet in fact is on the loftiest mountain plateau of the inner continent, several thousand feet higher than any portion of the surrounding country. It is the most beautiful place I have ever beheld in all my travels. In this elevated garden, all manner of fruits, vines, shrubs, trees, and flowers grow in riotous profession. In this garden, four rivers have their source in a mighty artesian fountain. They divide and flow in four directions. This place is called by the inhabitants the navel of the earth, or the beginning the cradle of the human race. The names of the rivers are the Euphrates, the Pison, the Gion, and the Pitical, as 
we sort of went over in the foreword from the author that these are you know, directly from the Bible. And as noted here, and the Lord God planted a garden and out of the garden made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for the food. It's from the book of Genesis. Genesis 2 and 7. And the Lord God, so this is the uh, interaction, this is the second creation story, not Genesis 1, but Genesis 2. Then Yehovah Elohim formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. And the man became a living being being and Yehovah Elohim planted a garden in Eden in the east where he placed the man he had formed, that is Adam. Out of the ground, the Elohim Yehovah gave growth to every tree that is pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The unexpected awaited us in this palace of beauty. The finding of our little fishing craft that had been brought before the high priest in perfect shape, just as it had been taken from the waters the day when it was loaded on board the ship by the people who discovered us in the river more than a year before. We were given an audience of over two hours with this great dignitary who seemed kindly dis disposed and considerate. He showed himself eagerly interested, asking his numerous questions and invariably regarding things that which his emissaries had failed to inquire. At the conclusion of the interview, he inquired our pleasure, asking us whether we wish to remain in this country or if we prefer to return to the outer world, providing it were possible to make a successful return trip across the frozen belt barriers that encircle both the northern and southern openings of the earth. My father replied, it would please me and my son to visit your country and see your people, your, coll your colleges and places of music and art, your great fields, your wonderful forest of timber. And after we have had this pleasurable privilege, we should like to try and return to our home on the outside surface of the earth. This son is my only child and my good wife will be weary awaiting our return. I fear you can never return, replied the chief high priest because the way is a most hazardous one. However, you shall visit the different countries with Jules Galeda as your escort and be accorded every courtesy and kindness. Whether you are ready to attempt a return voyage, I assure you that your boat, which is here on exhibition, should be put in the waters of the river Hittical at its mouth, and we will bid you Jehovah speed. Interesting. Jehovah. It appears they used the, uh, that's amazing. I don't know if they just use this as a, as a terminology or, you know, you know, of course, well, anyway, hard to say. Thus terminated our only interview with the high priest or ruler of the continent. Wow. Really quite incredible. That's the end of part three. Full playlist down below for the other parts and for the next part will be also there part four in the end of the world all right if you like this please like share and of course subscribe appreciate that and wish you a fantastic day take care